Good morning, Corey. How are you, Lance? Um, well, it is so good to see you. Uh, I know we're only a few blocks away in McKinney, <laughs> yep. Texas, uh, but nonetheless, this is the beauty of technology. Exactly. So I guess we've been connected probably now for eight, nine years at least. Quite a while. Yeah. And so it's been fun just to, to see you uh, deliver uh, content both online, but also your work here in McKinney and North Texas. Uh, so look forward to diving into uh, some topics that honestly, a lot of people are probably uh, shy of talking about in yep. a public forum, uh, especially uh, when it comes to the topic of, I mean, your website, remind me where your website name so I don't mess it up. So it's sexymarriage.net now. It started as simple marriage, but it's morphed into sexy marriage. So sexymarriage.net. Uh, and tell us real quick about your podcast that you release uh, once a week as well. So Sexy Marriage Radio is a weekly show that comes out every Wednesday. There's two versions, a regular version, which is just easy to subscribe, find on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, any, anywhere you find content, audio content, it's available there. And then we also have a subscription service that if you want a, additional content to get an extended version of the show where we go uh, about 20 to 30 minutes longer with deeper, a deeper dive on a subject, then you subscribe for that through sexymarriage.net. Cool, cool. So our, our similar hearts and backgrounds uh, kind of got us connected through pastoral work uh, that was years and years ago for you uh, but you spend most of your time now uh, in the marriage context and helping marriages thrive uh, yeah licensed marriage and family therapist uh, licensed professional counselor uh, how can people find you uh, here in McKinney and tell us about your work here in McKinney locally so uh, I do a couple days a week of private practice where I'm working predominantly with couples um, I usually get a lot of the tougher cases, it seems. Uh, just that's been my wheelhouse of working with some of the couples that have had some chronic or major crisis that are going on. I also work uh, online with people as well. And then individually, uh, you know, both in my office and online. And then I've morphed the last couple of years, I've morphed working a lot more with men uh, through a mastermind group format, which has oh, been. Wow one of the most fun, productive, effective ways uh, to, to work on and create lasting change. So that, that's been a ton of fun. So, so what is it about your work uh, that you believe that you're getting some of the more chronic cases or difficult cases uh, here in, in the North Texas area and, and just across the country? Um, probably because of the view I have in the way I come about therapy. Um, it's not, I don't do handholding. Um, I'm very confrontational and upfront. I figure couples or clients are coming to me for honesty and, um, I try to speak to the best in people, which typically they rise up and and acknowledge the best in themselves. And that's what totally transforms the path forward for them. Um, you know, sadly, you're in the field enough to know that a lot of what is out there is band-aids. It's not really getting to the symptom and, or to the, to the root, they're just treating the symptoms. Let me rephrase that. So it's, I, I try to deal with the process of what's going on and reframe it and challenge it better because you can't fix. I mean, this is one of my fundamental beliefs is marriage is not a problem that's solved. You know, we, we don't ever solve it because one, it's not a problem, but two, it is conflict. <laughs> so we're, we're going to have conflict in it. And if you can challenge yourself and how you view that to think that that's not something wrong, that's actually a process that's designed to help us each grow and be better. I think that changes everything and it empowers both people to to take charge differently and, and move forward. Right. So when, uh, when a couple comes to you, um, what is typically uh, some of the, the presenting problems, uh, stuckness that they're dealing with in the context of their marriage? 
Well, most of the time it's uh, infidelity. Um, it's some sort of betrayal. Um, it's, it's some sort of lying, <laughs> you know, that, cause that's, and that's, what's interesting, Lance, is I think if you look at a lot of the issues we have in life, you can almost boil them down to it's an honesty problem. Right. That we, cause that's even the couples that come to me that uh, have had infidelity. This is what research continues to show. Oftentimes the betrayed spouse isn't so angry about the fact that there was a betrayal. They're, they're most upset and angry about the fact they were lied to, you know, cause they asked and it was flat out. Oh no, no, there's nothing, you know, and it's, that's the hurt that really right. does sting on a deeper level. So, and then, you know, there's also that element of couples coming just that they just, they can't get on the same page. It's constant fights. It's, it's constant avoidance where one just doesn't come home and they're choosing other, you know, to stay working longer or get involved in all these other things. So they just are avoiding each other. And finally one spouse will make a critical mass move of, you know what, something's got to change. And that's usually what brings them into my office. So in your work with uh, those types of scenarios, um, I mean, I guess the, the common myth with a lot of people going to see a therapist uh, is that, man, this is going to be a 12 month or 24 month ordeal where we've got to dole out, you know, just tons of money. But it sounds like you're, you're trying to get to the root a lot quicker. Uh, so what encouragement do you have uh, for people listening that would help them get to the root uh, quicker? Um, well, I, I mean, a lot of this would be just recognizing how do I look at this dynamic and, and own my own role in it? Because one of the fundamental truth of a relationship is we co-create what happens. Mm. That doesn't mean for an affair, for example, that doesn't mean if my spouse has an affair, it's my fault, but I did co-create the environment to where they chose someone else. And that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, but it's recognizing the truth in it to go, okay, I I gotta look at the fact that maybe I wasn't all in, maybe I wasn't honest, maybe I wasn't engaged, or maybe I have had poor judgment all along and I'm with a person that just has no moral code. They've just sold me and I've never really trusted that what they're selling me isn't true, you know? so it's, it's, it's not, not that there's a right way, right. but it's a more solid way to look at life. And I think when you can get to that, typically we know what our next step is. You know, I don't need someone to tell me what my next step is <laughs> once I understand myself better. Yeah. I'm, I'm willing to take that step and take the hit that comes along with it. Yeah. And that is a hard truth to, to realize that uh, we co-create the environments in which we're uh, putting up with. Yep. Uh, so, so with that in mind and with infidelity in mind, uh, I know the common struggle uh, that's often in the room with my clients is that sexuality, whether it's infidelity, pornography, some of these more common problems that are coming up, oftentimes one, it comes up in the first session or it may be the fourth or fifth session uh, down the road that the truth and honesty actually uh, comes out. So how could you begin to address uh, healthy sexuality and uh, go in that direction with our conversation? Well, in a, in a therapeutic or coaching arena, I think you address it by just being upfront as the way you start asking questions. And even in a pastoral arena that, I mean, if there's one thing churches need to be better at is, is addressing the issue of sex and sexuality because going silent isn't working, you know, and, and trying to just do the, it seems to be the unspoken silent uh, shame is is the way it goes that it's, it's shamed that you have sexual desire rather than how how about we look at the fact that that's a normal thing. How we steer it is what matters. How do we do it in, in good God honoring, marriage honoring self honoring even ways so i think in that arena it's it's just it's being willing to ask the questions you know if i'm that's one of my first questions is is uh, it we're quickly going to get to it 
important because I have a belief that how you do sex is how you do life and how you do life is how you do sex. So those are always interchangeable. So if I feel like we're stuck in one area, I go to the other because it, it helps me get a clue of who they are and, and what they're doing in life. Um, on just a, in my own life level, I think it's just, how do I recognize a, a congruency of my life that am I congruent in living life as a sexual being right. that I channel it to things that matter, that mean something that are uplifting to me and that what I do is in the open. I'm not hiding stuff, right? That it's right. obviously there's secretness and appropriateness and right. you know, normal, normal seas of that, but it's just seeing this as how do I look at this whole, whole arena of my life as this is a big part of me that's not just a component. It's all interwoven. It all impacts each other. Right. Right. Well, and it, it, I mean, it's that, that common lie that we're sold, you know, uh, that, that you hide it, put it in the dark, and the shame uh, continues mm -hmm. to grow. And I'm sure that's more often to not uh, that what leads to the pornography and the infidelity uh, is, is the secretness of this. So unpack your statement you just made. I mean, that was a loaded statement. Uh, how you do sex is how you do life. So unpack that for us. Well, it's, it's, it's more, it's, this isn't come down to actions, but this is built off the last statement I had of we don't live compartmentalized lives as much as we like to think right. we can. So there is fundamental processes in the way I live that if I am an outgoing gregarious kind of a person I likely am going to be seeking that in sex I will try I will conduct myself that way as well if I'm more reserved I don't like risks I like my comfort zone you can almost guarantee the sex you're having is right in that comfort zone all the time and anything that pushes me beyond that I, I shut down you know I don't I don't allow it to happen or I don't participate and the thing I love about just buying that, that framework is if I wanted to challenge myself a little bit, I can do it either in my sexual and intimate, intimate relationship or in just in my life and they'll bleed off each other. That if I wanted to all of a sudden, you know what I need to, I want to branch out a little bit and, and really kind of speak up a little more in my life. Cause I've had too many times that people just running over me and, not asking my opinion and I just cave in and please. And if I'll be honest, I'll look back and go, you know what? I kind of do that in sex too. I don't do this for myself as much. So I'm going to start speaking up. I don't like this. I want to do that, you know, and, and those two, it, they're, they're both forward paths. Right. And so right. it's really not a, uh, it's not a descriptor to box anybody in. It's just a descriptor to look at how do I see my life and do my life better. Right. Right. So what's the, the tips uh, that you give your clients as they are leaving your office in order to kind of practice, have a voice to, to realize either side of the, the, the pendulum that they may be on. Uh, how do you encourage them to kind of live this wholehearted sexuality? Well, usually because of the confronted style I live and, and work with, they've already started it in interacting with me okay. because I don't, I mean, one of the things I love, this is my, this is an ego side of it, I guess. But one of the things I love is a lot of times when I have couples that are coming to see me that have been to a lot of other therapists in their history at some point during the first session, which my sessions, I, I usually try to steer couples to two or three hours at a time, rather an hour is not enough. Oh. So at some point during that first session, I love it when they may look to each other and go, this isn't like what we normally do, oh. right? This is, this is different, right? And because it's like, yeah, it is because I've, the, the training I've got is just a different, it's, it's counter to a lot of the field. Um, so, me doing that and them coming back at me changes their dynamic. And so I'm not a therapist that gives homework. I don't think I ever have even a couple that's asked for it. I don't, from what I remember, I don't, I didn't give them any because I believe if I do my job right, there's plenty to process 
and confront and deal with outside. So a lot of it just, I mean, Lance, I think it boils down to this. When you will change and challenge how you view what's going on, you change what you do. That if I see a disagreement with my wife as not something going wrong, but something revealing about me that I could grow and ask myself the hard questions of what am I holding on to so tightly or why am I being affected by this so much? And when I can challenge that, I, I change. And that's all I have control of in a relationship anyway and in life. Whereas most people come in, I mean, be honest, we come in, change my spouse, fix them. They're the reason I have grief. Every and time. <laughs> yeah, so maybe, maybe they are a contributor to it, but I'm co-creating that. Yeah. So yeah. I, I have to handle me better. Yeah. So, so about sexuality, uh, when you have a couple uh, coming in, uh, either he or she's dealing with pornography because it's a common issue for both now, and I don't think we need to isolate um, and mm-hmm. it's the male struggle and or um, what's also common is that they come in with someone having sexual abuse history and all of a sudden they're, they're bringing that into their relationship um, they're, and they're, it's these false perceptions of what sexuality is and so okay. how do you begin to work through uh, some of that tension that that exists one because of something that's been done to you or two, because of something that you're choosing to participate in? <clears throat> well, um, the idea of when you're dealing with sexual abuse, you probably look at what's most beneficial to me is how am I still operating according to that structure when the abuse is no longer really occurring? But how have, what is what have I bought into because of that I've not confronted, that I've just accepted as, oh, well, this is it. Or, right. you know, so how do, I, how do I challenge some long-held beliefs based on it and, and confront it and see it for what it really is and what it really was? Um, but that, that's a little different than what do you do with a couple that's coming in with something that's ongoing like a pornography Right. or other acting out behaviors, um, then you're, you're talking about creating a framework to understand what's going on in, within the context of the couple. Because the biggest thing I see is, you know, a, a husband that's been caught with pornography, which probably was in existence long before the marriage, right. because yeah. lots of us, myself included, believed marriage would fix my pornography issue. Right. Lo and behold, it doesn't because it's, right. it's not a marriage issue. It's a, it's a me issue. And getting a spouse to see it's not about them. They're just collateral damage. It's not their fault. Even if they were the most sexually active being with their spouse, that would not most likely make pornography go away for right. them. Right. So separating it down to put it on each person's shoulders um, is, is one of the best things you could do to start. Then the other biggest thing to counsel on this, so if you've got any leaders or pastoral people that, that watch this in the future, um, one of the worst things you can do when you're dealing with pornography in a marriage is have a wife be an accountability partner for the husband or vice versa. Okay. That is not their job. That is the most destructive thing I've seen happen. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to really confront this, um, you have to do it with your own gender. You have to have real people walking alongside you with it and giving you a place to, to stand up and be held, held accountable for what your decisions are. And then offer grace as the, as, as we go through and grow, because we don't always get it perfect. Right. But it's a journey of, of moving into more real. And so when I do that in life, that spills into marriage, that spills into other things that I have outlets that are better with my desires. Right. So, so you really take a pretty uh, strong position on that. Uh, let's get you healthy individually, even though y'all are here together. Yeah. Uh, and you're doing that in a very, uh, well, marriage, yeah, but mar- marriage does not exist outside of the two people. It's not a third entity in my mind. It's not something we 
spill into to fix it that dynamic works on us i i think most couples and people have it wrong you know in reverse that it works on us more than we do on it and so how do i keep that perspective constantly going because that's what i'm most responsible for right right well and that's what i've found just working you know with marriages and leaders is that uh, right. So goes your marriage. So goes your leadership at, at work and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes just because, uh, I like your word of collateral damage, you know, uh, e- either spectrum of the system that we're talking about. And so how do you begin to walk someone through, uh, this growing up, uh, this ability, as you said, to kind of, Hey, let's talk about what you can put on your own shoulders and help you, uh, grow up. How does that really play out for you? Well, the biggest thing is probably just someone either being a source that will be confrontive with you with your best in mind until you learn how to do this yourself. Um, to be able to have the courage to ask the question. Um, okay. So here's my pain points, you know, cause everybody could list off real quickly. Here's my frustrations. Here's the, here's the gripes I've got, you know, My wife doesn't listen. She's not around. There's not enough sex. She's, you know, he's always gone to work. He doesn't care about this. He's, you know, all the different things. And so when you, when you get that list, the next courageous step is to ask yourself, okay, what's my role in allowing this or creating this? Because I play a role somehow because maybe and the worst in us will come in and say, well, but I tell them, I, I speak up. I, I'm like, yeah, you maybe do, but you're not really standing up and, and making choices. You're just more complaining, wanting them to change. And a lot of times we get so trapped in our thinking that we feel like if I was to really make a stand, the marriage may end. And the truth is, yes, that may happen. That is the reality that systems exist according to the two people and not always do both people choose it. So I have to recognize most of the time when I make a shift, it's not that precarious. Okay. Right. You know, if I have, if I finally like, you know what, this behavior has gone on long enough. I'm removing myself from it for a little while. So tonight I'm sleeping on the couch because I just want, I'm not going to be a part of this. I'm not going to be treated this way. I'm not going to be spoken to this way, whatever it is, I'm handling me different. That's what creates the shift in the system. And you see if the system goes to a new norm or it goes back to the old norm. And most of the time we make the big move and it goes back to the old norm, old norm because I give back in, right? I get that little short honeymoon period and then it goes back to what it was. Even even the way you're talking just now, I think those are the simple things that I think in our paradigm and our worldview that we kind of see through. So so back up and share just how you were talking in I statements uh, and how that helps somebody kind of begin to take responsibility for themselves. Well, this is that this is just that whole scenario of all I can really do is handle me. Okay. I mean, one of the phrases I've heard is if you want a better marriage. Um, and this, this, I, I love this. I mean, you've heard the hula hoop mentality. Um, the other one is very similar, draw a circle around yourself and then fix everything inside that circle. You know, so it's just, that's the whole premise that if I come at something with my wife, cause we've been married 25 years at the time we're talking that if I come at her and say, you know what, this, this bothers me. I need you to start doing blah, blah, blah most likely she's going to go noted. Okay. And maybe she does not Maybe she doesn't. Right? right. Because it's not on her radar. It's not a pain point to her. Okay. So it's like, whatever. But if I come back and say, okay, you know what? I've brought this up. This is really bothering me now. And here's what I'm going to start doing differently to try to address this. And I follow that with actions, not just words that puts better pressure on the system and on her to see life worth being with, with me means I have to look at, look at things differently right? because I handle me differently. And too often we get caught in, I need you to start whatever, rather than, I don't know if I'm going to take being talked to like this anymore. 
That's a different phrase rather than you need to watch your tone. Right. Right. You know, because then, then we get into this, every one of us has this rebellious stage. Don't tell me what to do. Yeah. I'll talk to you however I want, blah, blah, blah. But if they hang up or walk away, I look foolish. Right. Right. So, so, so much of this sounds so simplistic. It is. <laughs> it's hard to do, yes. but it's simplistic because yes. life is fairly simple. Right. <laughs> if you think about it, human right. existence is not all that complex. We've, we've really added a whole lot of complexity to this, right. thinking we can solve it rather than realizing I'm not trying to solve life. I'm just right. trying to live it. Right. Well, and, and even with that, uh, so it's so common in North Texas, everybody's working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, uh, trying to squeeze in a, a session, right? Uh, how do you confront the reality of if, if things are going to change, things have got to change? Uh, because of the, the pressures of life and, and living life to the fullest is not really what we think it is, right? Yeah, I don't know if I have to confront that for people because life will take care of that for me. That if there's, if I've got a pain point and I just get to a point of I'll just tolerate it, eventually life will make it intolerable. Right. Right. So most of the time, I mean, this is the way we parent, I hope, that you, <laughs> you, let, you let kids face the natural consequences of their choice. Right. You know, it's being able to say to, my middle school kids, you know what? I got no problem with you repeating this grade. If you don't want to handle your side of the grades, mm. I'll drive you to sixth grade again. That's fine. That's not mine. I, I'm done with school. This is on you. Right. Yeah. And it's allowing them to face life. And that's what marriage is so sophisticatedly de designed to do. Right. Is I have to face life on life terms. And so if I've got this problem of, hey, this is just bothersome because you never leave the house and blah, well, then start leaving the house without them and put pressure on it. And if they're like, you're never around, yeah, I'm not, but you're welcome to come with me. Huh. Right? And that, at least you start using the pressure, you're calling out the pressure for what it really is right. rather than thinking the pressure shouldn't exist. Right, right. So in, in your sessions, uh, since you're going like two to three hours and, and trying to get a lot of work done, uh, how, how frequent are you working with, with couples per se in, in this stance that you're taking? Well, one of the, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things is I do a three day intensive and that's the three hours usually each day in a three days in a row. Okay. So it's nine hours of therapy in three days. Um, if I see a couple for two hours, lots of times that means I'll go every other week with them. Um, sometimes it's a little more intensive in the sense that they want to come every week for two hours. Um, I don't have a set structure other than an intensive of here's the framework of when I'll see you next. Right. I have the, the mindset of just by challenging people, it usually makes the process pretty fast okay. because I don't do handholding the couples or the people that come to see me that say, Oh, we were with our last therapist for two years. I'm like doing what, right. You know, that, that means you guys were paying for not real honest work in a sense, because it's like, right. Right. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, you guys need, you guys have to, I, I mean, I honestly work myself out of a job with every client as fast as I can. I mean, that's, because I figured that's what people, that's the most respectful way to treat people. Right. Right. Just get them well, on their own two feet. I've told almost all my clients, if, if we're doing this 10, 12, 15 sessions in, I said, I'm not doing my job. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, so you're really counter, honestly, a lot of psychotherapists in this area who, yeah. who are going to spend tons of time on the past. Yeah. Uh, so how have you wrestled through like your approach of like what, what I would consider more of a coaching stance, let's get you moving forward uh, and appropriately have empathy around the past, but also appropriately move forward. Uh, okay. And and empathy is an interesting word. Let's circle back to that in just a minute. Okay. Just because and, and how can you share, I guess, with, with leaders and marriages that are, are watching, 
uh, on, okay, yes, we're talking as counselors, but how do, how do they transfer what we're talking about into like uh, taking action as well? Okay. Um, well, the, the main belief is our past has influence on our, on our present and our future. So I can either dig into the past to try to understand what all's happened and make right. sense of it and then try to make the bigger courageous leap to see what am I doing now that's perpetuating it. Or I think I try to do it concurrently. How do I look at, you know, I get some behavior that is repeatedly coming up on like, wow, why do I have this passive aggressive trait in me? Right. And that's what, that's what infuriates my wife so much. What is it? What is that? Huh? Okay. So that's from my parents. Ooh, that's from their parents. Okay. Now all of a sudden I get an idea of where it comes from, but what matters is what do I do with it now? Not the fact that, Oh, well I came by this. Honestly, let me make sure I carry the family code forward. I mean, if I want to make that choice, at least honestly make that choice, you know, honestly tell my wife, Nope, you're just married to a passive aggressive SOB. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Right. Cause then at least she can make an informed decision. Right. But instead you can, I think you can challenge your, your past now and do it different, thereby taking care of your past to a degree by confronting it different. But the idea of empathy, again, most of the field has this as I care, I'm, you know, I'm, I walk alongside, I'm gentle, I hold your hand, I prop you up. That's not empathy. Right. Empathy is I care enough about you to tell you the truth, (laughs) right? To, to say it right to your face. Because that's uh, because I care about your well-being as a being, right. and so if you have got things that are going on in my mind that are skirting a path or avoiding things or something, you need someone that's going to come in and say, "Hold on, right. how long do you want to keep doing this? Because this is what's happening. This is what I'm seeing." Right. And so it's it's not the touchy feely in the way most people think of it but it it truly is built on respect because i care right and because most most humans care right that i mean in general most people are good yeah. i mean that's more and more people are confirming that so it, it's just it's just challenging what's going on and then it comes down into my own life if i'm just talking about how do i live do i carry that same empathy to the people i live life with you know do i you know, I've got a 13 year old daughter that asks some really tough questions a lot of times. And do I tell her the truth? You know, even when that can be kind of harsh, when she's like, do you think I'm wise behind beyond my years and stuff? I'm like, yes, but you also have a a hint of arrogance with that, honey. Right. And it's just rather than soft, soft tiptoeing around that, how do I just honestly, because if I'm living my life according to that structure, she knows I care. She right. knows I'm invested. I right. don't have to remind her of that every time. Right. And it, when I'm doing life like that, people know where you stand. And biblically speaking, I think that turns into my yes is my yes and my no is my no. You right. know who I, I know where I am and people know where I am. Uh, uh. So I know you're not overtly advertised out there as a, as a Christian counselor. Uh, I mean, I know you faithfully follow Jesus and, and love him deeply. Uh, what, what encouragement can you give the pastoral leaders watching this, knowing both of our backgrounds um, and the struggles and the tension that pastoral leaders face? What encouragement would you like to give them in the context of their marriage and in the context of their, their leadership? Um. Well, in the context of their marriage, if they're in the ministry and they are the type of people that are quote unquote, really successful pastors, but suck at home, they are horrible pastors. That's just the truth. Because if you're not living at home with the people that really see who you are, you're deceiving yourself. So it's being willing to have that courageous conversation of with myself. I mean, I, I, I know this, I was in it as a minister that I mailed it in at home and there was 
almost catastrophic consequences because of right. right fortunately because of grace and the strength of a wife to be confrontive and then courage to actually confront myself that put us on the path where we are now so right. it's just recognizing i've got to care for home and and be honest about that um then the the other thing is just how do i then conduct myself with my people that I, that I shepherd, that I minister to, that I teach, that I counsel, that I care, you know, how do I make sure I'm embodying Christ and all that means in the sense of I, I speak the truth, even when it's not going to be pleasant and agreed upon. And it's not just about how many programs we've got or numbers we have or whatever. It's about how am I living the kingdom and right. bringing it forward in my own life and in the people I touch. That's good. So I know you're, you're a curator of content. So it's been a blast to watch you uh, over the years develop and grow and uh, develop even your sex, sexy marriage content and podcast. What are you, what are you working on uh, that, that is bringing you joy right now or what is coming down the pipe uh, that we can watch out for? Um, well, everything we do right now is based off of the, off of sexy merge radio. So all, all the energy, the last six months, and then on into night 2019 is geared towards just producing really good content on the show. Um, one of my words for this next year is called is streamline. I live according to three words each, each year rather than resolution. And one that's already started to come to the surface is streamline. And so, I'm spending the time right now between Thanksgiving and Christmas uh, evaluating what do we really do well and what do I really do well and how do I make sure I enhance that, not add more. Hmm. And so I'm kind of going off of the, what is it? The hedgehog concept of, you know, what, what am I bet really good at and how am I doing that? Not, not avoiding that. And right. so the show is, is, is our main thing. Um, and then trying to do more of the mastermind mind, mindset of getting people together with other people that really do get skin in the game and have a challenge to be better, to really confront life better, to not sit on the sidelines because as men, we suck at friendships. A lot of times we can do really well around something where if we all go watch a game together or we play a game together or we're coworkers or there's a task involved, we're good at that, right? We can, we got that, but to truly get to where people are in my corner, that they see me, they know me and I know them. Uh, that's a foreign concept to a lot of us. And so a mastermind group is, is the way I have found it's six months long and it, and it truly does give guys some momentum to change life and challenge life to be better. And what they find is they've got brothers in arms that are in the trenches with them that, that will, that will speak the truth to them, but also completely love them. That's cool. That's cool. I love it. So remind us again, uh, just where we can find you and connect with you both uh, locally and well, ev yeah, ev everything's at sexymarriage.net. Um, it all is housed there for online coaching, offline, in my office, masterminds, the show, um, book that I have. Uh, you know, any anything that's that's available, it's all in that one location. That's the only site I have is sexymarriage.net. Cool, outstanding brother. I truly appreciate your time and yeah. All honoring this and jumping on this morning. So blessings to you in 2019. You as well, man. All right. Take care.